If the producers will produce the merchandise, I'll guarantee you, us salespeople are absolutely going to get out there and sell. Zig Ziglar is the salesman salesman. The man who, by his own stunning example, single-handedly turns selling into the proud profession. Yes, I'm proud to sell because, you see, our land has been developed because we are a land of salespeople. A small-town boy who eked out a living selling cookware before making it to the top. Zig will show you how his methods can work for you. We really haven't done a very good job of letting people know what the sales profession is all about, but we're correcting that right now. For nearly 20 years, Zig Ziglar has conducted successful motivational sales seminars worldwide. Known as the master motivator, he has turned his one-man operation into a large Dallas-based corporation. Selling in the professional sense is uncovering a need and then bringing to that individual the products or the goods or the services which fill that specific need. As salesman extraordinary, Zig Ziglar will tell you how to charm your client, persuasively present your product, and close the deal. Regardless of what it is that you do, you enjoy the high standard of living that you do because salespeople like me are out there selling. Let's join Zig Ziglar now as you have a front row seat at his most successful sales seminar and learn how to make selling your proud profession. I've ever seen as many men as badly overmarried as this crowd is. <laughs> Got redheads in everybody. Now, I mention redheads because I'm married to a redhead. My wife's a decided redhead, uh, meaning, meaning simply that one day uh, she just decided uh, <laughs> she's going to be a redhead. Yeah. What a delight to see so many ladies here. You know, not only do ladies dress audiences up so much, but Realistically, women are just so much more practical than men. Uh, like this lady down home, this bum came up to her on the street and said, Ma'am, said, would you give me a dollar for a sandwich? She said, well, not until I've seen the sandwich. <laughs> now, <laughs> you know, now that's practical. Uh, uh, like, like the two ladies talking, one of them said, well, I didn't want to marry him for his money, but that is the only way I could get it. Now, you, 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 you see, <laughs> that's practical. And what I'm going to try to be this evening, I'm going to, and what I'm going to try to be is practical myself. I want to talk with you about the greatest profession on the face of this earth. I want to talk to you about the sales profession. I believe, oh, go ahead, I got time. I just happen to believe that America is the greatest land on this earth uh, because we are a land of salespeople. We're certainly not the greatest because we're the biggest because we're not. Russia and China and uh, Canada, Brazil, they're all bigger than we are. We're not the greatest because we have the most people. Why, India and Russia and China got lots more people than we have. We're not even the biggest because we have the most, are the greatest because we have the most natural resources, though we've certainly been abundantly blessed in that area, but then so has India, for that matter, much of Africa, parts of Russia, Canada, Brazil, all rich in natural resources. No, we're not the greatest because uh, we uh, have the most people or the most land, but we're the greatest because essentially we are a land of sales people. And I don't know how you feel about it, but I, for one, am tremendously excited about being a salesperson. The truth of the matter is, America was discovered by a salesman. <laughs> Not by any stretch of imagination could you accuse Christopher Columbus of being a navigator. 
Now, if you'll remember, folks, that dude is looking for India. Now, he missed it 12,000 miles. Not by any stretch of imagination could you accuse him of being a navigator, could you? And you might say, uh, well, yeah, but was he a salesman? Well, let me tell you the story. He was an Italian in Spain. Now, that's way out of his territory. <laughs> He's only got one prospect to call on, and if he misses a sale, he swims home. Now, you tell me, was he a salesman or not? He called on Isabella, told her the story. She says, Chris, it sounds like a good idea, but man, $12,000 for five little old ships? See, a lot of people don't realize they started out with five, but two of them did go over the side. You know? <laughs> and you might as well know now, I tell folks I'm like a cross-eyed discus thrower. I, I don't set any records, but I do keep the crowd alert. And, you know, and, and I think that's important. Uh, he told Isabella the story, you know, and uh, she related to it. She said, you know, it sounds wonderful, Chris, and if I could raise the $12,000, you know, I'd buy the idea in a minute. But we don't have any money. How many of you salespeople have ever had a prospect tell you uh, that they'd buy if they had the money, but they just don't have the money? Well, well, Chris looked at her and he said, look, Izzy, now understand, I, I was not there, so I'm not certain this is verbatim, but you, you got that string of beads hanging around your neck. Now, let's take him out of the pawn shop. We'll hock him. We'll finance this deal. Well, your history books will clearly tell you they used some unusual methods to raise the money to finance the trip. Then when they started sailing in those three little ships, Columbus really had a sales job because those sailors thought they were going to go over the side. I mean, literally. And every single day, he had to sail in order to sail. And as a matter of fact, he had agreed to turn back towards uh, the homeland if they had not discovered or sighted land within a certain time. And just eight hours before the crucial decision was made is when they discovered the land. And the call came forth, land ho! And the most profitable sales call in history came to a close. And then Columbus made the mistake that a lot of salespeople make in our world today. He did not service the account. He did not keep on selling. And a man named Amerisus, Americus Vespucius entered the picture, and he serviced the account. We did not become the United States of Columbus. We became the United States of America. America was populated by a salesman. Sir Walter Raleigh toured the coffee houses of London, selling those ignorant, fearful, superstitious people on the idea that they should leave the relative security of their homeland and come into this vast, uncharted, foreboding, uh, weird wilderness that lay beyond the sea. It was a tremendous sales job. We were freed by a salesman. Do you really understand the tremendous recruiting job that George Washington had to do? He had to convince the farmers, the merchants, the backwoodsmen, the shipbuilders, the landowners, and all of the people to leave their homes, go to war against the most powerful nation on the face of this earth, large largest army, most powerful navy, and he had to be honest and say, now look, if we win this war, there's no way I'm going to be able to pay you. And if we lose, they're going to hang you to the highest tree. <laughs> now, how many of you sales folks do any recruiting? Can I see your hands, please? Now, I want you to visualize this scene. You're trying to recruit somebody to sell with your company, and you have to tell them, look, if you make the sale, I don't have any money, I'm not going to be able to pay you, but if you miss the sale, we're going to line you up at daylight and we're going to fire away. Now that was the job Washington had to do, but he did the job. You know, we won our independence. As soon as we won our independence, Alexander Hamilton, the first secretary of the interior, or the treasurer rather, came to Mr. Washington and said, let's get the Congress to appropriate some money so that we might study the methods the British have used to establish their agents and factories around the world. The money was appropriated. I don't know if you've ever thought about this or not, but as you realize, ladies and gentlemen, for the first 168 years that America was populated, we had only moved to the Appalachian Mountains. Did you realize that with the appropriation of this money, we did set up trading posts, and just 30 years later, we were all ready to the Pacific Ocean? Yes, I'm proud to sell because, you see, our land has been developed because we are a land of salespeople. 
Now, at this point, you might have a question in your own mind. Well, Z, if that's the case, if we as salespeople have done so much, why is it that salespeople are held in such low esteem? Why is our reputation not better? Why is it that people do not respect the profession, uh, you know, more than they do today? Well, I believe, ladies and gentlemen, that one of the reasons that only 2% of the graduating seniors from college today are interested in going in the profession of selling is because we have not done our thorough job as salespeople. Basically, there are four reasons why the profession of selling is not regarded as high as it ought to be and is fast becoming, I hasten to add. Number one, did you realize what the dictionary says about the word sell? The dictionary says it's a fraud. It's a hoax. It's right there in the dictionary. Can you believe such a thing like that? We ought to sue those rascals for writing such things as that. Number two, we've done a lousy job of selling the profession of selling. Now, we've sold our goods, we've sold our products, we've sold our services, but we really haven't done a very good job of letting people know what the sales profession is all about. But we're correcting that right now, and you're part of the correction, because by the time we get through here, you're going to have that jumping up and down enthusiasm about the profession of selling. See, a lot of people are tremendously proud of their company, awfully proud of their products, their goods, or their services, but for whatever reason, they seem to be a little hesitant to let people know they're in the profession of selling. We just simply have not done the sales job. Now, there's the third reason why a lot of people don't really understand what the profession of selling is all about and why they have so many erroneous ideas. A few years ago, a fellow named Arthur Miller wrote a play. He called it, of all things, Death of a Salesman. And they feature some dude named Willie Loman, the perennial loser. And a lot of people have come to identify that with the sales professional. And that is absolutely weird, wild, insane way out. Doesn't make any sense. They showed that thing on Broadway as a play. They made a movie out of it a long time ago. And I thought they'd finally put the deal to bed. And then they showed it on television. And then they showed it again on television. And then they revived the play on Broadway. And now they're doing the same thing again. I could not believe. Why don't they make a play entitled Death of a Doctor or Death of a Lawyer or, you know, or something like that? It'd make even more sense. Absolutely. And then you take the music man, fellow named Harold Hill, the consummate con man. Uh, you know the story behind him. And a lot of people have gotten these weird ideas, therefore, from these presentations about what the profession of selling really is all about. And then there's a fourth reason, and that's this old Yankee peddler image, which is still a hangover. You know, an amazing number of people think that, any, that a good salesman can sell anybody anything under any circumstances. That's crazy. Only a con man could do a thing like that. Selling is not making people want something they don't need, nor is it making them buy something they do not want. Selling in the professional sense is uncovering a need and then bringing to that individual the products or the goods or the services which fill that specific need. Now, let me see if we can establish some things here with some questions. How many of you folks sell a pretty good product? Can I see your hands? Okay. How many of you sell an extraordinarily good product? Can I see your hand? How many of you believe that when you sell that good product, well, let me ask you this way. Uh, the product you sell, how many of you sell one that solves a problem? Can I see your hand? Okay. How many of you believe that when you sell a product that solves a problem, that you deserve a profit? Can I see your hand? Okay. How many of you believe that when you sell two products that solve two problems, that you deserve two profits? Can I see your hand? Okay. Now, what you're saying is that the more problems you solve, the more profit you deserve. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth because as the late Fred Herman would say, that ain't sanitary. Uh, but that really, uh, you know, that really is what you're saying, isn't it, okay? Now, how many of you have been in the profession of selling for as long as a year? Okay. How many of you have still got all of the money you've earned in the last 12 months? 
Okay? How many of you have got customers whom you sold a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago, who are still using and enjoying the benefits of what you sold them a year or two years ago or five years ago? Can I see your hands? Now, here's a very important question. Who made the best deal? Was it you or the customer? The customer, all right? Then is the sales process something you do to somebody or something you do for somebody? Isn't it for somebody? See, I fought in the ring two years. Matter of fact, the only reason I quit was because of my hands. The referee kept stepping on them. You know? <laughs> About one of the things, well, one of the things the, uh, the coach used to always tell us when he had send us out, he said, now, Zig, the first round, spar around, find out where the opponent is weak and capitalize on the weakness. In football, the coach says to the quarterback, find out where they're weak and exploit that weakness. In tennis, the instructions are find out where the opponent is weak and exploit the weakness. In the world of selling, we find out where the opponent, that is the customer, is weak, that is, has a need, and strengthen that need by selling them our goods, our products, and our services. You see, it really is true, folks. Selling is something you do for somebody and not to somebody. And that's our role. That's why we want to simply bring to you what is the truth about what this profession really is all about. Because a lot of times people say, okay, Zig, uh, you got me sold that the selling profession is a marvelous profession. Now tell me the truth about these salespeople and tell me what the salesperson receives as a result of doing all of this selling and all of this serving. Basically... In my judgment, the salesperson is the ultimate free person. You're in business for yourself, but not by yourself. You see, the truth of the matter is you're the chairman of the board. You're the president. You're the secretary of treasury. You're the chief executive officer. You're the administrator. And oh, yes, you're the janitor too. I mean, as salespeople, we do the whole bit, don't we? But the nice thing about it is you can get up any morning you want to because you occupy all of those positions. You can get right in front of that mirror, give that big old grin, you know, like a fellow I saw the other day, the only guy I've ever seen who could eat a banana sideways. I mean, <laughs> listen, <laughs> That guy was grinning. I mean, he really was. Well, you can get in front of that mirror and, you know, you can look yourself right in the eye and say, you're such a nice guy or you're such a nice girl. You deserve a raise. And the board just met. The vote was unanimous. The raise will become effective just as soon as you are. I mean, you see, the nice, thing, <laughs> the nice thing about this profession of selling is that we do have that ultimate freedom. Now, when we talk about ultimates, also in my judgment, it's the ultimate security in the world of selling is where you're going to find it. As you might recall, in the last recession, you know, the newspapers and the television and the radio have predicted 18 of the last two recessions. I mean, they seem to be right on the target, as my good friend Don Hudson would say. Uh, but, you know, when you, when you analyze what they really say, when you look at the last recession, for example, there were some pilots and attendants who lost their job. There were some executives, some builders, some manufacturers who lost their job. There were secretaries and stenographers and file clerks who lost their job. There were teachers and superintendents who lost their job. There were a lot of people who lost their jobs. These were honest, sincere, dedicated, hardworking, intelligent, committed people. They lost their jobs not because they were not committed, not because they were not productive, but they lost their jobs because of the economy that we experienced. Now, I challenge you, name me one honest, sincere, dedicated, hardworking, productive salesperson who lost their job during the recession. <laughs> Ultimate security. Ultimate security. Absolutely. I'll never...
I'll never forget, I was doing a sales training seminar in Atlanta, Georgia. And these two young men came up to me and they said, you know, we'd like to get our money back uh, on the seminar. And I said, what's the problem? They said, well, uh, we just got fired from our job. And we uh, have no need for sales training if we don't have something to sell. And I said, well, let me ask you guys a question. Do you like to sell? They said, oh, yeah, we love to sell. Well trained. And they were good-looking young men, 25, 26, 27 years old, sharply dressed, you know. And they said, we just had a personality conflict with the boss. I said, well, would you like to have another job in the world of selling? They said, we sure would. I said, you come on into the meeting, and I'll have you 25 job offers before you leave out here tonight. Is that a fair deal? They said, it's a fair deal. And then that night, I asked the question, how many of you, well, I'll ask you, how many of you folks here tonight are in the world of selling, and you're recruiting or hiring salespeople? Can I see your hand? Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you have an opening right now for an honest, sincere, dedicated, conscientious, hard-working, productive salesperson. Can I see your hand? They literally had more job offers than they could even remotely consider for at least the next two weeks. Now, why is that? Simply because a salesperson has the greatest security in the world. General, General Douglas MacArthur said that security is the ability to produce. And my friends, if you've got that ability to produce in the world of selling, I can absolutely guarantee you, you really do have that security. Now, you know, when we do have recessions, we deal with them in different ways. For example, in the business community, in the regular uh, uh, business structure, you know how they deal with recessions and uh, declines and drops in business. They get these, all of the people together. And the president of the company, you know, gets on his best sad look, and he wears his sad suit, you know. And he makes this little brave speech about, we've got some tough times ahead, but we're going to tough it out. I mean, we're going to tighten our belt. We're going to cut the lights off early. I'm sorry. We're going to have to let a few people in this department go, and a few people in this department go, and a few people in the other department go, and we're really going to have to be on this austerity program, but we are going to tough it out. And that's the way they deal with the recession. Now, when sales organizations are confronted with that situation, they call another big meeting. They get all of the folks together and say, now, folks, you know, we hear this talk about this recession, but we have figured out a way to deal with it. We are all just going to have to work real hard to reduce our sales, and that's the way we'll solve the problem. <laughs> Isn't that the way they generally handle it? Or do they get everybody together and they say, hey, you've heard all of this baloney about a recession. Let me tell you our answer to that. Man, we're going to put on a sales contest like you have never heard of before in your entire lifetime. We're going to put up prizes like you cannot believe. We're going to involve here some motivational training programs and some sales training programs. And we're going to have some incentives here that will absolutely boggle the imagination. And I'll tell you what's going to happen. We're going to get out there and we're going to show them where a recession is. We know business is never either good or bad out there. Business is either good or bad right here between your own two ears. And if you're thinking it's stinking, your business is going to be in the same shape. We're just going to give all of you a little checkup from the neck up, and we're going to go out there, and we're going to knock them dead, and we're going to sell, sell, sell. Now, let me ask you a question. During the last recession, whenever it was, how many of you actually sold more during the recession than you'd sold before the recession? Can I see your hand? Ah, in the world of selling, an absolutely incredible thing. Yes, indeed. Indeed, the salesperson really is an unusual individual. Do we make money? How many of you read U.S. News and World Report? Can I see your hand? About a little while ago, in one of the issues of U.S. News, they had a fascinating article in there. You know what the article said? It said that more salespeople are millionaires than doctors. Now, I don't know how that gets to you, but I kind of say, aha, uh -huh, hey, what about that? We make more money than those dudes make. What about that? Yeah. I had to. I had the privilege just last week of addressing a sales organization. Their average income was over $70,000 a year or in that neighborhood. And that's one more really nice neighborhood, is it is, you know. I talk to salespeople all the time who their first year in the business make twenty dollars and $30,000. I've seen them who make $100,000, $200,000. As a matter of fact, years ago, Charles Schwab, who really was the master salesman and Diamond Jim Brady, those 
this dude made a million dollars a year selling over a hundred years ago. An amazing thing, this profession of selling. Yes, there is a substantial about of, amount of income possibilities there. But you know what else? The Cox Report revealed here about two years ago uh, that in the world of selling, we're the ones who supply by far the biggest majority of the corporate officers. Now, many years ago, it was the salespeople, and then they drifted into the accountants and the attorneys, and they made uh, the corporate officers out of them. But in the last five years, and the trend is now on a runaway path, they are realizing that what they really need running the organization is the optimistic, positive thinking outlook of the sales organization and the sales person running that organization. They need somebody so optimistic they'd go after Moby Dick in a rowboat and take the tartar sauce with them. I mean, basically, uh, you know, that's the kind of individual that uh, they are looking for. Yes, it's great to be a sales person. Now, hopefully, I've exploded a lot of the myths about the profession of selling and what the salesperson himself or herself really earns. But the question comes up, who is the best salesperson? What type individual or personality makes the best salesperson? For years and years, the general public has been led to believe that it's the extroverted, happy-go-lucky, back-slapping, uh, hail-fellow, well-met, joke-telling uh, uh, kind of an individual who makes the best salesperson. I'm glad you're seated because this might shock some of you. But if we were to divide this audience right here into two groups, one group are all introverts and the other group are all extroverts, I got news for you. The introverts will outsell the extroverts a hundred times out of a hundred. That's right. Now, that probably shocks you. Now, that doesn't mean that maybe the best salesperson might not be an extrovert. They could well be. But I'm talking about over the long haul. Now, why is that? And incidentally, let me hasten to add, the introverts, in many cases, have acquired some of the characteristics of the extrovert. I mean, they've learned to be a little more outgoing, a little broader smile, a little more enthusiasm, and a little better handshake, and this kind of thing. But I'm talking about the nature of the individual. Why would the introvert make the better salesperson? There's several reasons for it. First of all, it is because the introvert is far more likely to be better organized and they're better students, they study the procedures and the techniques. They're not as likely to sell by the, quote, seat of their pants. They will follow the procedures which are there. Number two, they're more detail-oriented and, incidentally, more people-oriented. They're far more inclined to ask questions to uncover the needs of the prospect and find out what the prospect needs instead of trying to roughshod, run over them and die dominate them with personality and tell them all about the wonderful merits of their merchandise without finding, first of all, if their needs will be met by what they're selling. Third thing about introverts is realistically, folks, uh, they're more introverts than they are extroverts. And so they have more people to relate to as far as the process of selling is concerned. So what can uh, those who are extroverts do about it? The same thing that introverts can do. You can acquire the training, the characteristics, and the habits of the introvert just as the introvert needs to acquire some of our characteristics. And yes, people can definitely do that. This is probably going to shock most of you when I tell you this. Because all you've seen me here is in front of a group of folks and I'm laughing and I'm talking real loud and I'm bouncing up and down and I exude a lot of energy and a lot of confidence and a lot of enthusiasm. So when I tell you this, it's probably going to shock you. But I too am an introvert. Very much so. Now you might think I'm the loudest introvert you've ever seen uh, in your life, but emphatically I am an introvert. I have simply acquired some of the characteristics of the extrovert. You see, you're not stuck with the way you are. 
One of the most exciting things I can tell you is that you can change. I can tell you that you are what you are and where you are because of what's gone into your mind. And you can change what you are and you can change where you are by changing what goes into your mind. And the beautiful thing about the profession of selling is you have an opportunity to be with and around the optimistic, the positive thinkers, the people who are encouraging and building you up and helping you to do more more of the good things of life. When you start talking about the salesperson and the kind of individual involved in it, I think one of the most exciting reports I've ever read was put together by the Forum Corporation out of Boston, Massachusetts. They did a considerable study on 341 salespeople. 173 of these salespeople were the top-notch producers. I mean the super productive salespeople. 168 of them were average salespeople. Now, all of them had been selling at least five years, so we can eliminate the rookie factor. They came from 11 different companies, five different industries. They sold everything from petrochemical, uh, banking, life insurance, real estate, and one or two other things. But in this analysis, they discovered that from a pure sales knowledge, sales skill point of view, uh, that the 173 top salespeople and the 168 average salespeople all had almost exactly the same sales skills. Each group knew exactly how to get prospects. Each knew how to get appointments. Each knew how to demonstrate features and benefits. Each knew how to handle objections. Each knew how to close the sales. But there was a dramatic difference in the results because there was one factor that the super salespeople had. And that one factor that the other ones did not have in as large a quantity was this word called trust. Now, my selling friends, listen real good. As I often tell people, this is profound. What they found is this. People don't buy based on what you tell them. They do not buy based on what you show them. They do buy based on what you tell them and what you show them that they believe, pure and simple, which they believe. Now, the question is, who do they believe? It's an old-fashioned answer. They believe the good guys and the good gals. Those who are morally sound, who have honesty and character and integrity as the regular tools in their sales arsenal. You see, the most important part of the sales process is the sales person. Very important. Now, you see, that kind of shoots the myth that a lot of people have about the salesperson. The career salesperson understands a lot of things. For example, we learn some things about human nature that helps us deal with our wives or our husbands or our children or our neighbors or somebody like that. For example, as salespeople, on occasion, we do have folks who are a little rude to us. How many of you have ever had a prospect who was rude? Maybe even mean, a little ornery? Would you believe? downright nasty. Well, you see, one of the things, not often, fortunately, but it does happen. One of the things we as salespeople learn and understand is this. When somebody is mean and ugly to us, we learn to understand it is not because they want to hurt us, but rather it is because they themselves are hurting. And you see, once we understand that, then we can deal not only with them more effectively, but also with our families and our friends and those whom we love. I believe beyond any reasonable doubt that in America, if every policeman, if every politician, if every school teacher, if every civil service worker, if every individual on any kind of payroll anywhere, if they had to go to a real gung-ho sales meeting every Monday morning before they started walking their beat or delivering the mail or doing whatever job they do, I believe we would have an infinitely better, happier, more excited producing America. How many of you would agree with that observation? Absolutely. Now, of course, ladies and gentlemen, everything is selling and everybody is a sales 
person. Whether you're a dentist, a doctor, a preacher, a teacher, a coach, a child, a music manager, doesn't make any difference what it is that you do. Everybody is a salesperson. Let me share a couple of examples with you of what I'm talking about. When I was between the 11th and 12th grades, uh, during uh, World War II, I went to junior college so I could pick up some extra classes so I could get in the Naval Air Corps. All right. Now, I had to pick up an extra course in history in order to graduate, and so I would be free then the following my senior year to take a lot of extra math and science. Well, I didn't want to take American history. What possible good is it going to do me, uh, you know, to learn something that happened 100 years ago or 200 years ago? But I had to learn it, so I was going to go in there, and I was at least going to pass, but don't think I'm going to try to remember it. I'll just transfer the knowledge from the teacher to my mind to the pad, and then I'll get out of there, and they'll end it. But the teacher threw me a curve. He was coached Joby Harris at Hines Junior College in Jackson, Mississippi. And you're talking about a salesman, folks. He was a salesman. He spent that entire first period selling me on why I had to learn my history. He really put the story on me. He also sold me that as an individual, if I had any ability that permitted me to do more than support my family, that I had a moral obligation to my fellow human being and my community to donate some of my services for the betterment of mankind. I walked out of that classroom that day a history major. Only subject I made consistent A's in throughout the time I was in college. What I do today in all of the activities outside of my actual business was directly, emphatically influenced by that salesman, a school teacher, Coach Toby Harris. Everything is selling. I'll never forget when our second daughter was born. Our first child was three uh, years old at the time. And I'd been out on the road not long after our baby uh, brought, came home from the hospital. I'd been out on the road and I got stuck. There was a snowstorm and I spent the night in a Greyhound bus, fortunately, on the side of the road. When I got in the next morning, I was exhausted. There was about 10 inches of snow on the ground. And I'd no sooner walked in and just had my top coat and my gloves and my hat off when the redhead said to me, Well, honey, uh, we got to go to the store. We, got, we need some things. So I reluctantly put all the gear back on and my three-year-old said, Daddy, I want to go. And I said, oh, Susie, I said, the weather's too bad. It's too cold and wet, and uh, I won't be gone long. But she said, Daddy, I'll be so lonely. I said, oh, Susie, you won't be lonely. I said, your mother's here, the maid's here, your baby sister is here. I said, you won't be lonely. She looked right at me, and she said, but Daddy, I'll be lonely for you. I don't need to tell you she went to the store with me. You see, the truth of the matter is, the truth of the matter is, everything is selling. The third example, at our church, we recently got a new music minister. Now, please understand uh, that I've got the kind of voice that uh, prompted Mitch Miller to write me a personal letter asking me not even to bother to sing along with. And, I, you know, I want you to understand it. My own children asked that I not sing in church. But last Sunday was our first Sunday, and this minister had the congregation so excited. He sold them so much on participating. Now, he knows his music, too. But he had us so gung-ho that for the first time in my life, I actually enthusiastically got involved in the singing process. Everything, ladies and gentlemen, is, is selling. I mean, everything is selling, and that's one of the reasons that I'm so excited about it. The question might come up, well, what role does selling play in the economy? Well, I can tell you this. Several years ago, the Secretary of Commerce of the United States said this. He said that what we need in America today is one million more sales people, professional sales people. Have you ever really stopped to figure what happens when you make a sale? 
Now, when you make a sale, let me ask you, how many of you write your order on an order form or an order blank? Can I see your hands, please? Okay. Now, when you make that sale, do you understand, do you realize fully that the order pad you wrote it on did not start out as an order pad. It started out as a tree. And you're the person who paid those people who went out in the woods and cut that tree down when you got out there and made the sale. And then a whole bunch of people hauled that tree to the paper mill, and you're the person who paid those people to haul that tree to the paper mill when you got out there and made the sale. Now, in the paper mill, you see, there are hundreds of people manufacturing that tree in a paper, and you're the person who paid those people to manufacture that tree in a paper when you got out there and made the sale. But it goes so much further than that. You see, when you made a sale, you made a profit on that sale. And if you're lucky, your manager made a profit. And if you're real lucky, uh, your company made a profit. That's the way you stay in business, you know. And so you take part of your profit, you go down to the store and you buy a can of beans. And in essence, the grocerman says, if you're going to buy my beans, I've got to get some more. He goes to the wholesaler and said, need more beans. Wholesaler said, if you're going to buy my beans, I've got to get some more. He goes to the canner and said, need more beans. Canner said, if you're going to buy my beans, I've got to get some more. He goes to the farmer and said, need more beans. Farmer said, if you're going to buy my beans, I've got to get some more. Uh, and to do that, I've got to raise them. To raise them, I've got to have a new tractor because the one i got's worn out. He goes to Emma Dillon and said, hey, I've got to have a new tractor. Emma Dillon said, if you're going to buy my tractor, I've got to get another one because these are all we've got. He goes to the factory and said, hey, got to have new tractors. And the factory said, if you're going to buy our tractors, we've got to manufacture some more. To do that, we've got to bring in iron, copper, plastic, steel, aluminum, lead, zinc, spark plug. Well, we've got to set up factories all over the world. And all of that happened because one day you got out there and made a sale. That's right. And that's what you ought to tell folks. <laughs> Why am I excited about the profession of selling? I'm excited about the profession of selling, ladies and gentlemen, because as I said earlier, I believe it is the most secure profession on the face of this earth. If my son were to come to me and say, Dad, I want to get into something that is absolutely secure, what would you suggest as being the most secure thing on uh, this, uh, in our country? Without hesitation, I would say, well, son, you ought to get in the world of selling. But suppose my son were to say to me, but wait a minute, Dad, don't most salespeople work on a commission? And I would say, yes, son, salespeople are just like everybody else. Everybody works on a commission. But, Dad, I thought your secretary, for example, had a salary. Oh, she does, son. She's on a salary. And as long as she's productive, she will continue to receive the salary. <laughs> now, when she's no longer productive, what's going to happen to the salary? That's right. It's going to go. See, I don't care whether you're president of the company or even the president of the United States. If you don't do like you're supposed to do, they'll get you. <laughs> And you full well know what I'm talking about, don't you? Now, you see, the beautiful thing about the world of selling, I would say to my son, is it's one of the few professions that I know of that is absolutely not prejudiced. You see, that order doesn't care whether you're white or black or brown. It doesn't care whether you're female or male. It doesn't care whether you're old or young. It doesn't care whether you're educated or uneducated. It doesn't care whether you're introvert or extrovert. When you come bringing the orders in, ladies and gentlemen, and they start writing those checks, it's based on your performance, not the color of your skin, not your sex, not your religious beliefs, not anything else. It is the most fair profession that I have ever seen in my life. I love to sell. Now we've got, oh, go ahead, I've still got time. <laughs> Now, there's, there's, an awful lot, there's an awful lot of selling we still need to do. For example, in our society today, did you realize that 42% of the time spent on jobs is wasted? That's right. I was talking to Dr. Tor Dahl, a uh, time management and productivity expert, internationally respected at the University of Minnesota. I said, Dr. Dahl, and uh, when we were chatting and it was a lengthy discussion, I said, I've read this figure, but I have difficulty believing that that much time is wasted. He said, well, Zig, when you count people coming in late and leaving early, 
extended coffee breaks, unusually long phone conversation, too many trips to the restroom, taking time off to smoke those cigarettes, the gossip that goes on around a lot of these places, too long at lunch, uh, making, uh, writing those personal letters and all. He says actually 42% is a conservative figure. What we need to do, ladies and gentlemen, is sell everybody on doing their very best. When we sell that idea, I'll absolutely guarantee you the trade deficit will absolutely disappear. If the producers will produce the merchandise, I'll guarantee you us salespeople are absolutely going to get out there and sell. We really are. Now, you're talking about imported? Let me tell you something when you start analyzing the sales profession. Even as I make this uh, presentation, around our country there are certain organizations which are on strike in various plants and mills and institutions and so forth. But let me tell you to think about this. If you ever uh, have any doubts about your validity as a profession and what you do as a person, I want you to think about this. Did you realize that if everybody in America who sold anybody in anything under any circumstances, whether it was a piece of pie, a loaf of bread, a can of beans, a gallon of gas, a life insurance policy, a home, uh, some pills from the drugstore, a suit of clothes, some hair shampoo, a necklace around uh, your neck or a microphone around your neck. If everybody in America who sells anybody anything were to go on strike just for 24 hours, did you realize we'd be thrown in a recession, ladies and gentlemen, that it would take us months and months to recover from? The damage to our economy would be absolutely incredible. You see, what I'm saying is the profession of selling is such a marvelous, marvelous profession. I'm so proud to be a part of it. And I hope that the next time anybody says anything remotely derogatory about this profession of selling, if they get a little negative and say something about those salespeople, I hope you will smile, be very gentle, and be very loving. But look them right in the eye and say, let me tell you something, friend. You enjoy the incredibly high income that you do. Whether you're the postman or the postmaster, whether you are the teacher or the superintendent, whether you're the sailor in the Navy or the admiral in the Navy, whether you're a uh, clerk in the congressman's office or the congress, where are the congressperson, regardless of what it is that you do, you enjoy the high standard of living that you do because salespeople like me are out there selling. Be proud you sell, ladies and gentlemen, by these ideas we've been talking about. You see, what I'm really talking about is an attitude toward the profession. So you acquire the skills, acquire the professionalism, learn the techniques and the procedures, and buy this idea that selling is a magnificent profession. Because if you do, I can close by saying, I'll see you. And yes, I really do mean you, my selling friends, at the top. Yeah. Thank you. Here are additional audio and video cassette programs that will give you further insights on how to become more successful in your own life. To complement this video program by Zig Ziglar, here is a six cassette audio package, See You at the Top. Zig is at the top himself, and he shares with you his message, Don't give in to life, dig in. Zig speaks to you as if you were a guest in his living room and shares the secrets of getting everything you want in life. Zig Ziglar, see you at the top, a must for your audio cassette library.
Dennis Waitley reveals the systems and strategies for always finishing best in this six cassette audio program, The Double Win. Be a better parent, strike better business deals, and feel better about yourself in everything you do after listening to The Double Win with Dennis Waitley. In his six cassette audio program, Tough Times Never Last But Tough People Do, Dr. Robert Schuler shares with you his experiences as he provides a blueprint to turn what seem like hopeless situations into stunning success stories. Tough times never last, but tough people do. A must for your library. For the first time on video cassette, Leo Bascalia opens his arms and his heart to you and your family in this wonderfully inspirational message entitled, The Politics of Love. Join Leo as he faces an audience of more than 10,000 and embarks upon an hour full of love, laughter, tears, and hope. For more information on any of these albums and for a free catalog of all of the Nightingale Conant audio and video cassette programs, write Nightingale Conant Corporation, 7300 North Lehigh Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, 60648 or call 1-800-323-5552.